So, let us continue with the topic of uh, chromatography and uh, how to model this uh, particular uh, packed bed system and what are the issues while modeling. So, typically if you look at a chromatography you are going to get a Gaussian type of uh, peak leaving the column and uh, this is called the retention time the T naught and this is the maximum concentration it reaches. And uh, if it is a normal distribution or if it is a Gaussian distribution then uh, we said uh, this is the equation for a Gaussian distribution you have a C equal to C naught exponent minus T by T naught minus 1 whole square divided by 2 sigma square. Now, T naught is your retention time and the standard deviation for this Gaussian distribution will be T naught sigma. Okay. So, making use of that uh, we brought in the concept of uh, number of theoretical stages or theoretical plates. Um, so, the theoretical plates or theoretical stages or is connected to sigma in this particular fashion sigma square is equal to 1 by n. So, if the sigma becomes smaller and smaller n becomes larger and larger. So, sigma is related to standard deviation by this equation T naught into sigma is equal to standard deviation of the Gaussian curve. Okay. So, if the if the Gaussian curve is very very sharp then your number of theoretical plates is going to be very large and if the Gaussian distribution is very broad then the number of theoretical plates you can say is less. And then you also have a relationship between C naught and C f by this equation. And then later on we also looked at another equation which connects the retention time T naught with the several parameters the operating parameters as well as the chromatographic column parameters like epsilon, epsilon is the porosity of the packed column, um, V is the volume of the packed column, Q is the flow rate of the continuous phase. Now, K is the equilibrium constant, okay. if it is a liquid liquid system we used to call it partition coefficient otherwise we can call it an equilibrium constant. So, if you incorporate all these then the equation for C becomes like this. Okay. So, you have here you have the number of uh, theoretical stages and then here you have the uh, T naught which is the uh, retention time and similarly we can have an equation for retention volume also um, where you have V naught is the quantity of the liquid that needs to be collected downstream of the pack column uh, so that it reaches the maximum or the peak. Okay, so, we use these equations quite a lot and we did uh, a lot of uh, um, mathematical derivations and uh, design calculations. We will look at them again once more in some of them because this is a very important set of equation which describes the performance of a chromatography. We later on introduced something called uh, error function. Okay. This is also called a Gauss error function or a probability integral because uh, it is a it is an integral between limits between two limits. Okay. So, f x or the error function of x is given by 2 divided by square root of pi integral 0 to x e power minus t square d t. So, if you look at the function it looks like this no it looks like a sigmoidal curve. So, between 0 and 3 it starts from the value of 0 and then it goes up and saturates at 1 and in the negative direction uh, again uh, it starts from 0 goes down in the negative direction and saturates at minus 1. So, there is a table which gives a numerically integrated values for f x for different values of x you can see that when x is equal to 0 the error function of x is equal to 0 and it keeps going up initially sharply as a representation of this, but then later on it sort of uh, stabilizes peters out okay. and then it reaches a value of 1. So, beyond a point uh, um, you around point 0.15 or 1.6 or 1.7 you can see the um, error function of x is almost close to 1 actually. Now, uh, this uh, particular table uh, was taken from a uh, 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 Wikipedia website. So, for any value of x we can calculate the error function from this particular table. 
So, this equation uh, uh, this table is going to be very very useful in calculating uh, yields. Now, imagine a situation in fact, this problem we did that in the previous uh, uh, lecture as well. So, imagine a chromatography um, peak like this at 170 minutes um, you have a concentration like this and the retention time is 190 minutes. Now, we want to know what is the yield at 200 minutes that means, if I collect the sample up to 200 minutes what is the yield of this particular protein. Now, many things are given here the T naught that is the retention time is given and then you are also given uh, some concentration value C at a particular time T. So, making use of this what can we do we can calculate sigma and then using sigma we calculate the yield at 200th minute. So, if you look at this equation we know C that is 0 0.0063, we know C naught that is 0 0.0152 and we know T naught which is 190 and we know T which is 170. So, by substituting all these we can get a value for sigma. Okay. So, that is how you do that by substituting all this into the equation we get sigma. Now, we go to the yield equation I hope you remember the yield equation yield is equal to 1 by half multiplied by 1 plus error function of t by t naught minus 1 by square root of 2 sigma. Now, why does this 1 comes in because um, we are going to collect sample up to 200 minute which is greater than the retention time 190 minute. So, if we keep collecting up to 190 minute the yield will be 50 percent that is 0.5. So, if you are going to collect beyond 190 minutes obviously, the yield is going to be greater than 50 percent that is why this particular term comes in here. Okay, now, um, we know sigma calculated from the previous case we know T naught which is 190 T will be your 200. So, you can substitute here. So, that will be your x. So, you from the table you can calculate f x substitute here and you get the value for the yield. So, easy it is. So, by plugging in all these numbers we get uh, the x hence the f x. Okay. So, straightforward very simple actually. So, it comes to yield is equal to 0.8 that means 80 percent yield. So, if I keep collecting sample up to 200 minute the yield of the particular product is going to be 80 percent. This is not talking anything about the purity please note that we are not talking about purity because there could be other components also coming in which may reduce the purity. So, if there are several components and um, if I keep on collecting one component then the purity may be going down. Whereas, uh, if I want a very high pure material obviously, I am going to sacrifice on the yield. Okay. Now, let us look at a uh, two component system you have a protein p you have an impurity i. I did introduce this problem in the previous class also I am repeating it again. So, that uh, you are well conversant with this particular uh, system. Now, imagine you have a Gaussian type of distribution for protein p uh, the uh, T naught or the retention time for the protein is 6.42 hours. Now, the impurity also has a Gaussian distribution, but it is coming at 7.6 hours. Okay. So, at 6.42 hours you have only the protein whereas, the impurity is 0 at 7.6 hours um, you have some amount of protein and uh, you have impurity at 7 hours you have very little of uh, the impurity and uh, predominantly more of the protein. Now, how do you solve this problem? Now, you will have two different uh, Gaussian distributions so, and you have two different retention times. So, obviously, you are going to have two different sigmas. So, how do you calculate those two sigmas? We can calculate from these places. We know that T naught for the protein, we know the T naught for the impurity correct and then uh, we also know uh, the concentration values at different times at you know the C naught for the protein we know the C naught for the impurity, we also know the concentration at some other intermediate time 
So, we can again use the equation c is equal to c naught e power minus t by t naught minus 1 whole square divided by 2 sigma square. I hope you remember this. So, um, for the protein t naught will be 6.42 correct and c by c naught will be 63 by 82 and t will be 7. So, we can calculate sigma. Similarly, for the impurity uh, c by c naught will be the same here as this, this divided by this and um, that is this value by 43 and t naught will be 7.6 hours and t will be 7. Again you can calculate a sigma for the impurity. So, you are going to get two different uh, sigmas like this, sigma for the protein, sigma for the impurity. Now, yield is given by this error function equation okay, where uh, half into f of t by t naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 sigma minus f t dash by t naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 sigma. So, if you are collecting the um, product between the time t dash to t then this is the equation for yield. Okay. And uh, the purity in this two component system is going to be concentration maximum into yield divided by summation of the concentration yield for component 1 and concentration yield for component 2. So, this is a two component system. Okay. So, now you know the sigma for the protein you can substitute it here okay. and you know the sigma for the impurity you can substitute here. So, you will have two equations separate separately. So, we can get yield as a function of temp time as well. So, the protein yield may build up and then uh, it sort of flattens out and then uh, the uh, impurity yield may build up and then uh, it sort of uh, flattens out. Okay. This is how it will look like actually. So, if I go further I will be collecting some amount of impurity as well. Whereas, if I am here, I am going to get pure protein. Whereas, if I travel little bit here, uh, I am going to bring in some of the impurity also in my product. So, the um, purity of the protein is going to go down. Okay. Uh, we also started introducing this uh, particular concept, which is called the continuous uh, packed bed model. So, if we consider our chromatographic column as a packed bed of consisting of a tubular uh, design, um, it is a continuous system. So, there is an axial uh, um, z axis. Okay. Now, the solute is uh, moving with the uh, continuous phase um, from one end and then it just comes out from the other end. Um, you have the packing material or the stationary phase uniformly distributed, there is a void edge. So, in the void space you have the liquid, liquid contains your solute, solute is also adsorbed on the packed material and the adsorption process could be controlled by several different types of mechanisms. We will talk about these mechanistic aspects later. Um, so, we have the solute moving in with the solvent or the mobile phase from one end to the other. So, solute is getting carried because of solvent flow, so, the solvent is flowing at certain uh, velocity. The solute is moving because of diffusion or dispersion, because there is always going to be a diffusion like your uh, fixed law of diffusion. I hope you all remember what is a fixed law. And then uh, this solute is going to get accumulated in the voids of the interstices of the bed. That means, the voids of the interstices of the bed is going to contain your uh, um, continuous phase solvent. So, solute is going to be present there and you are also going to have a solute accumulated or adsorbed onto the stationary phase that is the solid material. So, you have two accumulations. Okay. So, if you combine all these you are going to end up with a partial differential equation. This is a typical partial differential equation. So, on this side that is on the right hand side you can see you have a diffusion term here, this is called the axial diffusion or dispersion term and then uh, this is going to be a 
d square c by d z square. This term comes because of diffusion and then you have a flow term that means you are going to have a solute movement because of the flow. Now, z is the axis z axis. Okay. So, you have a um, term coming because of the diffusion of the solute in the along the axis and you have a term here which um, talks about uh, the uh, flow of the solute with the bulk uh, solvent. On the left hand side you have two accumulation terms, one term corresponds to the accumulation in the um, void space that is in the continuous phase, another term um, is because of the accumulation in the solid phase. Okay. So, you have two terms. Now, C is the concentration of the solute in the um, in the interstices um, or C is the concentration of the solute in the mobile phase, whereas Q is the concentration of the solute in the adsorbed or in the stationary phase. Okay. Now, epsilon is the void age that is voids and 1 minus epsilon is obviously the amount of uh, solids present. Okay. So, there has to be a relationship between C and Q and that relationship may depend based on the type of uh, mechanism that is operating. Okay. You can have different types of mechanism which uh, will determine what will be the relationship between C and Q. Okay. Um, so, you need to have a very simple mechanism then you will be able to solve this uh, equation analytically otherwise we may have to solve numerically. Now, you can consider several approximations uh, if you want to solve them analytically. So, now what are the approximations? We can assume that the diffusion or dispersion uh, is negligible that means, d square c by d z square could be omitted. We could assume that the accumulation in the void space is also negligible. Okay. Accumulation in the void space is also negligible. Okay. So, then what do you end up with? You will end up with the accumulation on the stationary phase that is the solid phase and this arises because of the flow of the bulk material, bulk solvent. Understand? So, we have neglected the accumulation in the void space or the mobile phase, we have neglected the dispersion. So, we end up with the simpler looking equation. Now, the you needs lot of initial conditions, the initial conditions are there are no solute adsorbed on the packing um, when the time is 0 or less than 0, because we have not uh, injected any um, solute, we inject solute only at time equal to 0. So, at any place inside the column when time is less than 0 q equal to 0 and at t equal to 0 that is at 0 time. Uh, we inject the solute at the entrance of the bed, because only at the entrance we are injecting these are the initial conditions, but uh, still it is not enough uh, if you want to solve this particular uh, partial differential equation. Okay. So, we need to have some relationship between q and c otherwise you will not be able to solve that. So, that means we need to have what type of mechanism is operating there could be lot of things happening inside um, physical processes happening because it is a chromatography we will assume there is no reaction. So, there, um, um, but there are lot of physical processes taking place which may be controlling uh, which determines the relationship between q and c. So, what are the various physical processes that may be operating here? For example, mass transfer from the bulk of the solution to the surface of the particle. So, you have the continuous phase flowing that is the bulk um, that is a liquid whereas, your uh, stationary phase is a solid and whenever there is a solid and a liquid interface there is going to be a mass transfer resistance for the solute to diffuse from the bulk onto the surface of the um, solid or the stationary phase. So, there is going to be a mass transfer number 1. Number 2 if there are pores um, in your stationary phase there could be diffusion of the solute into the pores. So, that could be controlling. If there is a reaction taking place then the reaction also may be controlling, but in, in a normal chromatographic system we shall completely omit this. So, these two things may be happening one is 
the mass transfer from the bulk of the solution to the surface of the catalyst or the solid material may be controlling or the diffusion of the solute from the surface of the uh, stationary phase into the pores may be controlling. So, depending upon which is controlling you may have different types of relationship between Q and C. Okay. So, you need to understand that depending upon which is the important equation or which is the major um, controlling factor you may have different relation between Q and C and if you know which is controlling and if you have some sort of a relation between Q and C then it will be possible for you to solve the partial differential equation which we talked about in the previous slide namely this okay, which is 1 minus epsilon into dq by dt is equal to minus v dc by dz where v is the velocity epsilon is the void age q is the concentration of the solute which is bound to the stationary phase c is the concentration of the solute which is present in the mobile phase and t is the time and the z is the axis. So, what it means? It means the concentration varies along the axis of the chromatographic column as well as the concentration varies as a function of time. Okay. So, if the mass transfer of the solute from the bulk to the um, surface of the particle is controlling as I mentioned this is a solid particle and the bulk solution is a liquid. So, whenever there is two different phases coming in in this particular case it is a solid and a liquid. If there is a gas then there could be a gas and a solid. If there is a absorption where you can have a gas and a liquid again there is a two phase system. Any two phase system will always have an interface and there will be a resistance for a particular component to move from one phase to another. It may be very slow, it may be fast, but still there is a resistance. So, in this particular case we call it the mass transfer resistance the movement of your uh, solute from the bulk to the surface. So, we can assume the concentration of the solute at the surface at C star and the concentration of the solute in the bulk is C. So, what, what does it mean? The driving force here is C minus C star okay. and the equilibrium interaction is between Q and C star not between Q and C please note. The, the adsorbed species is not seeing the concentration C, but it is seeing only the concentration C star and the, so the driving force is C minus C star. So, if the mass transfer of the solute from the bulk to the surface is controlling then you can consider equation like this 1 minus epsilon dq by dt is equal to k l a into C minus C star. Where C is the concentration of the solute in the bulk, C star is the concentration of the solute on the surface of your uh, particle, K L is the mass transfer coefficient, A is the packing area per bed volume and epsilon is your void age, Q is the concentration of the solute uh, on the stationary phase. Okay. So, if the mass transfer is controlling what this equation tells you is the accumulation of the solute uh, in the solid phase is exactly equal to the amount of uh, material which is uh, moving from the bulk to the surface. Okay. Okay. Um, so, with that equation you will be able to solve uh, the partial differential equation. Now, uh, let us again go back to our uh, Gaussian distribution or normal distribution for our chromatographic peak. So, we said the chromatographic peak looks like a Gaussian shape uh, with a retention time and a standard deviation. Now, the standard deviation can keep changing depending upon the type of mechanism. Okay. For example, the standard deviation um, in the previous case we talked about mass transfer controlling we said k k l a uh, is the mass transfer uh, rate c, c minus c star is the driving force. right? So, in such a situation then your sigma square standard deviation is sigma into t naught where t naught is the retention time. Um, so, if mass transfer is controlling then sigma square could be 
equal to v divided by k l a into l, v is the velocity, uh, l is the okay, length, k l a is the mass transfer coefficient, okay. k l is the mass transfer coefficient, a is the area per unit volume that is interficial area per volume actually. Now, a in a packed bed of spherical particle is uh, approximated like that, a is equal to f dash by d into 1 minus epsilon, d is the diameter of the spherical particle and f dash is 6 for if it is spherical and uh, it is equal to 4 for cylindrical type of particle actually. Okay. So, a is the interfacial area between the two phases, in this particular situation it is uh, the um, bulk liquid um, or the mobile phase liquid and the stationary phase solid. Okay. So, if you are decreasing particle size, we are increasing mass transfer coefficient, correct, because the A comes below. Okay. Decreasing particle size increases mass transfer coefficient. Okay. So, ideally it will be very nice to have very small sized particle, but then uh, in a packed column if you reduce particle size you are increasing the uh, back pressure that means uh, you need to um, have pumps which can deliver very high pressure that is why if you have a HPLC type of uh, systems where the particle size are in micron range the pressure developed by the um, column is so high that you need a very high pressure pumps. Increasing velocity and particle size increases sigma. Okay. So, if the particle size increases, sigma increases, if the velocity increases also sigma increases. So, if sigma increases obviously, the width of that Gaussian pulse also increases. Increasing column length decreases the width. So, if I have longer column, I am having more number of theoretical plates. So, the width of the pulse also decreases. Now, in addition the standard deviation changes because of dispersion of flow in the column due to poly dispersed packing material, because although they say we have uniform sized particles packed inside a chromatographic column, there will be still a distribution of sizes on the average diameter you know. So, there will be a plus or minus 10 percent of the average diameter. Um, so, the poly dispersity also will affect the standard deviation. Now, let us again uh, go back to the same chromatographic uh, um, output like this. Now, the retention time is 93 minutes. Okay. Now, I want to calculate what is the time required if I want to have 90 percent yield. This is a very important problem. I have a protein uh, in a mixture, I am running a chromatography and I know the retention time, I know the standard deviation, I want to know how long should I keep collecting uh, this uh, effluent, so that I get a yield of 90 percent. So, it is a very important problem. Now, the standard deviation for this system is 12 minutes. So, the uh, retention time is 93 minutes, standard deviation is 12 minutes. So, how do you calculate yield? Okay. Now, so I know T naught, I know standard deviation, so I can calculate sigma. 12 by 93. Now, taking this I can substitute into the yield equation. Now, the yield of course, I want 90 percent yield. So, obviously, uh, if I am collecting sam up to the retention time, my yield will be 0 0.5. So, anything above 93 minutes, my yield will be above 0 0.5. Okay. So, what equation do I use? I will, this is a general equation for yield, which is half into r t by t naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 sigma minus r error function t dash by t naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 sigma. But uh, because my yield is going to be more than 50 percent, I will use the simpler equation, okay, half into 1 plus error function of t by t naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 sigma. Now, in this equation, yield I substitute as 0 0.9, T naught is 93, sigma is given uh, by 
12 divided by 93. So, if I substitute all of them, the only unknown is T. So, from this I can calculate what should be my time until which I keep collecting the uh, effluent, so that the yield is 90 percent. Okay, so, first I calculate uh, sigma, then I substitute there. So, by doing this and now do I calculate F x, I if you remember I showed you a table where given a x I can tell you what is the error function x. Okay. So, if I keep collecting up to 115 minutes my yield will be 90 percent. So, you see this is a very important problem especially if we are um, um, wanting to collect as much as the uh, metabolite that is present in my broth as possible. Okay. So, I use uh, the same equation and uh, I have T that is the only unknown rest of the things are known. So, T comes out to be 115 minutes. Okay. Let us look at yeah, another problem where uh, we are looking at the type of uh, controlling mechanism. Okay. So, initially my mobile phase velocity is 30 centimeter per hour, now I am doubling it that means it is become 60 centimeter per hour. So, I want to achieve this 90 percent yield, now how long do I wait? Now the controlling mechanism is internal diffusion, the process is controlled by internal diffusion. So, if the process is controlled by internal diffusion, anyway sigma square is going to change okay, or the standard deviation is going to change or the width of the these peaks are going to change. right? Um, now, if the process is controlled by internal diffusion that means diffusion of the solute inside the pores of the solid matrix, then sigma square is proportional to V the velocity d square d the particle size, particle diameter and L the length. Okay. So, here I am doubling the velocity from 30 to 60. So, obviously, sigma square will get doubled or sigma will be square root of this number. Okay. So, I will get a new sigma, I know the old sigma. So, with the new sigma I substitute, so I should get a different time. Okay. So, now I have doubled so, my retention time was originally 93 minutes for 30 centimeter per hour, now I had doubled it. So, my retention time becomes half of that 46.5 minutes. Okay. Now, uh, sigma square is proportional to V d square by L, that means sigma is proportional to V raised to the power half. So, now originally it was 30 centimeter per hour, now the velocity has become 60 centimeter per hour. So, originally my sigma was 0.129, so now the sigma will be 0.182 because um, sigma is proportional to V raised to the power half, velocity has doubled, so you have to multiply by square root of 2. So, your sigma has gone up from 0.129 to 0.182. Now, I go back again to the yield equation, I take yield equal to half of 1 plus F t by t naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 sigma. Now, t naught has gone down remember I have doubled my um, flow rate. So, t naught has gone down from 93 to 93 by 2 and sigma has gone up from 0.129 to 0.182. So, I will substitute new sigma, I will substitute new, new t naught and again I calculate this error function and, and um, yield I want to know the 90 percent yield or 0.9, so I will calculate what should be my time. Okay. So, my new retention time is 46.5, my new sigma is 0 0.182, okay. my yield is uh, 0 0.9, so T has become now 61.8 minutes. So, if you remember in the previous case, Okay, so, T has become 61.8 minutes in the internal diffusion. So, if the internal diffusion is controlling factor 
then uh, sigma will be proportional to v raised to the power half and uh, when I am doubling from 30 centimeter per hour to 60 centimeter per hour my uh, time required to collect has become 61.8 minutes. Now, let us consider another situation the process is controlled by external mass transfer that means the movement of the solute from the bulk to the uh, surface because uh, of the two phase system is controlling. So, in such a situation it has been uh, uh, observed that sigma square is proportional to v raised to the power half where v is your velocity d is the particle diameter d raised to the power 3 by 2 divided by l, l is the column length. So, here it is a slightly different sigma is proportional to v raised to the power 1 by 4 whereas, if it is a pore diffusion it was like sigma proportional to v raised to the power half whereas, if it is external mass transfer sigma has become proportional to v raised to the power 1 by 4. So, same thing uh, original sigma was uh, 0.129. I have doubled the velocity, but the exponent is 1 by 4. So, my sigma has become 0 0.153. Now, again I make use of the yield equation 0 0.9 is the yield I would like to have. Uh, I know the T naught, T naught is the uh, reduced from uh, 93 to 46.5. My sigma has changed, uh, sigma has increased to 0 0.153. So, I substitute them inside this uh, same yield equation to get a new time t is equal to 59.4 minutes. See you see um, depending upon the controlling mechanism you can you will require different times for collecting your effluent to achieve an yield of 90 percent. Okay, let us consider another situation. Okay. Now, if the process is a set of ideal equilibrium stages, if you remember long time back maybe 2 3 classes back I talked about uh, ideal equilibrium stages. That means, the chromatography entire column is divided into n number of ideal stages. Each stage has the uh, stationary phase equally distributed. Okay. Now, the continuous phase is entering from end that is say from the left hand side um, and then it is leaving on the right hand side into each stage. So, from stage 1 uh, output goes into stage 2 and from stage 2 output it goes into stage 3 and so on. So, there is an interaction between the um, solute in each stage with the corresponding stationary phase. So, there is an equilibrium in each stage taking place between the um, solute in the continuous phase as well as the solute in the stationary phase in each stage. So, that is called an ideal equilibrium stage process. Okay. So, the entire column is divided into n number of ideal stages large number of ideal stages. So, in that situation sigma square will be proportional to 1 by L that is the column length. So, if the column length is very very large you have obviously, large number of ideal stages then your sigma will become small that means, the peak width will become very small obviously, the efficiency of the column is extremely good. If the column length is short your sigma will be large that means, peak width also is large that means, the efficiency of the column is not so good. Now, in such a situation in an ideal equilibrium stage sigma square is proportional to 1 by L. So, velocity you can see is not coming into the picture. Okay. Now, T naught is once again a half of 93 that because you have doubled the uh, velocity uh, from 30 to uh, 60, but sigma square will be unchanged because velocity is not coming into this place. Okay. So, you take this T naught you take uh, the old sigma and then put it into the yield equation and you should be able to calculate the time required to achieve the 90 percent yield. So, when if you do that 
ok. So, you take uh, your old sigma, so the sigma is the same whether it is ok, the n number of stages where n could be anything ok, sigma remains unchanged here because sigma is only a function of L, it is not a function of the velocity. So, the old sigma is taken that is 0.129, but the T naught is of course, uh, gone down from 93 to 46.5 because you have uh, um, doubled uh, the velocity. So, when you substitute that into the yield equation, okay, if you remember this yield equation yield is equal to 0.5 into 1 plus error function T by T naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 into sigma, you will get a new time. Okay. So, we see we saw three different situations depending upon what is controlling we, we said um, if the bulk mass transport is controlling that means, the solute movement from the bulk of the solution uh, to the surface of your uh, stationary phase or if the pore diffusion that is the movement of the um, solute molecules inside the uh, solid matrix is controlling that is one situation. Third one we looked at is ideal situation where we are dividing the our entire column into n number of uh, ideal stages and then trying to see whether that is controlling. Okay. So, depending upon the type of uh, controlling mechanism you may have different sigma values okay. and then uh, you use them all in your yield equation and when you use them all in your yield equation uh, you will be getting different uh, time until which you need to keep collecting the effluent, so that you achieve the desired 90 percent yield. Okay. So, um, a chromatographic column can have different types of mechanism, because uh, you have a packed system and uh, you have a liquid flowing from one end to the another end. So, you may be having a um, bulk mass transfer taking place from the um, bulk of the liquid to the surface of the particles or the stationary phase. Okay. Then this uh, particular solute gets adsorbed on the stationary phase and then they start uh, diffusing inside the pores. So, that could be controlling and if there is a reaction taking place between the solute and the stationary phase material or if there are any ligands present in the stationary phase material which is uh, acting as a catalyst then there could be a reaction taking place. So, all these could be controlling and uh, what does controlling means when I say controlling all these three may be acting in series, but one of them is the most important rest of them may be very very fast. So, if out of these three if two processes are very fast and if one process is slow. So, we call that as the controlling, because the other two fa um, processes we can assume takes place within instant of a time, whereas the third process takes much longer time to take. So, with, with the relatively it takes much longer time uh, to take with respect to the other two. So, we call that as the controlling. So, in this particular um, chromatographic situation we are saying that uh, the mechanism um, are varied, the bulk flow uh, the bulk mass transfer and then um, mass transfer from the bulk liquid to, to uh, the surface of the stationary phase and then there could be pore uh, movement inside the pores and then there could be reactions taking place and so on actually. So, depending upon various situations we say that um, the interaction between the solute molecule and the stationary material will change. And depending upon the these interactions um, or the strength of these interactions, the um, spread of these Gaussian peaks also change. So, when we talk about when we mention about spread, we are also talking about the standard deviation or we are talking about the sigma. So, the sigma also will change depending upon the mechanism, and if the sigma changes, obviously the peaks may be becoming broader or the peak may be becoming shorter or uh, very tight actually. So, we looked at large number of uh, um, mathematical uh, equations 
um, we also looked at various types of situations uh, which uh, help you in designing uh, the type of uh, um, process operations which we need to carry out. This, these operations could be the amount of time required to achieve 90 percent yield or if I collect for a certain period of time what is the yield of my product and um, if I have two or more different um, types of solutes, if I am collecting at different periods of time what will be the impurity levels um, and so on actually. So, these are very very useful especially if you are running a chromatography and if especially if you would like to know um, how to run a chromatography efficiently and try to get maximum purity as well as the maximum yield. Now, in the next class we will continue with the same chromatography and uh, we let us look at uh, um, use of chromatography in analytical purposes like you must have all heard about the HPLC the high pressure liquid chromatography or high performance liquid chromatography which is predominantly used for only analytical purposes where if you are interested in identifying a particular metabolite that may be present in your mixtures it could be a protein, it could be a biomolecule, it could be a small molecule or if you want to um, look at the quantity of that metabolite in the mixture we generally go for HPLC and it is very useful if uh, the component um, is not vaporizable. That means, uh, it may have a very high boiling point or uh, if I heat it up it may lose its activity. Then ideally this type of uh, um, analytical instrument predominantly the HPLC is extremely useful. So, that is what we will be talking about in the next class.